On October 25th, 2021, I started putting furries on my album covers. Well, I'd already done it a couple times. I seem to have had an aesthetic yearning for my music to be represented with furries since at least as far back as Christmas 2018, when I released Little Spoon. October 25th, 2021 is when I made it official, though, uh, when I bit the bullet and decided to fully commit to furry imagery. And it's gonna stay that way, so stop asking. It had been a long time coming. Releasing The Flowers of Robert Maplethorpe wasn't just a pivot to a style of art and presentation I liked, it felt inevitable to me. It felt like if I was going to continue being a musician, this is just what I had to do. I don't think I even knew why. I assumed it was because I'm a furry myself and I wanted to participate in the fandom in my own strange auditory way. But for some reason, I'm still thinking about it. Hmm. I was so proud of that little offbeat bedroom pop album from Christmas 2018. I was calling it my spiritual debut at the time. The first time I remember everything just kind of coming out the way I had envisioned it before I even laid down the first note of MIDI. The 30-odd releases I made before it were just practice, I thought. And now I can finally call myself an auteur. I also, realistically, expected that I'd eventually grow far enough past it that I'd begin seeing it as amateur hour just like everything else, but that didn't happen. That's still where I feel in my heart of hearts that my real discography begins. You have my blessing to marathon my discography starting at this point and no earlier. Only recently did I notice the coincidence that Little Spoon is also the first album I ever made with furries on it, of a sort. There's something there, I think. Something I felt got fulfilled by the presence of these little fuzzy guys on the cover. I gave them names too. Uh, the wolf's name is London and the wombat's name is Max. I even wrote that in the description so you'd know. Max was actually my persona, but I didn't tell anyone at the time because I was young and not brave enough to be myself. Now, this is gonna sound a little weird, but when I made this, I was trying to do something a bit like Ween's album, The Mollusk. You know, the one that played at the end of the SpongeBob SquarePants movie? Manager, this is the greatest day of my life! Ween is a comedy rock duo that slammed onto the scene in the early 90s with two lo-fi shitpost masterpieces. Then they got signed and their trajectory got a little weird. Pure Guava sounds like absolute garbage at all times and it feels like they're overcompensating trying to convince people they haven't sold out after being signed. Uh, it's still one of my favorite releases of theirs though. Like it's so fucking stupid and crass, but still somehow catchy as hell on multiple occasions. It's also very trashy and politically incorrect, if that's important for you to know. Uh, don't get too close as a song about in- but the budget went way up for the albums to come. Uh, we got far more colorful and incisive genre pastiches on albums like Chocolate and Cheese and 12 Golden Country Greats. And on first blush, The Mollusk might seem like another one of these. And let me be clear, it absolutely is. Hey, little boy, what you got The Mollusk is a nautical-themed satire of 70s prog and psych rock, and it might be the funniest thing you'll ever hear as long as you've listened to at least one Gentle Giant album. It's not even all that heavy on the punchlines, it's just that the vibe of it is simply gut-busting. It's unexplainable. It somehow perfectly gets across a sense of vintage faux intellectualism. It is painfully apparent that the entirely fictional 70s band being depicted here absolutely thinks they're blowing your mind with how cool and trippy they are, but it's just so dumb. All the time. This record positively stinks of pot. Summon the queen. Spoke the child. But at the same time, it is authentically psychedelic in its own way. It is inventive and infectious, with blinding hooks and endearing character voices everywhere. The theatricality is as genuinely playful as it is satirical, and there's a fun tension there, I think. Like, it never concretely stops being a comedy album where the singers are putting on a different funny voice for every track, but nonetheless, as we progress through the track list, it stops feeling so certain, because you gradually realize that it's somehow played straight the entire time. That might sound weird, but as I said, it's not really a punchline heavy album. If you fully buy into the fiction being portrayed here, it doesn't really take much to flip the switch and hear the sincerity in what's being sung. It's gonna be, in parentheses, all right, is engineered with terrifying precision to be the sappiest little breakup song you've ever heard, with a wah-wah guitar upon which you can almost taste the caramel. Gonna left you. 
but it's also actually kind of touching, you know? Like, like the only really explicitly funny thing about it is that it comes right after the Blarney Stone. Get off my ass, you wee bitty fuck. Catch me singing along to this one with the boys, am I right? It's shockingly easy to get invested in It's Gonna Be in parentheses alright as an actual breakup song is what I'm saying. This album is performing some kind of alchemy where it is both cynical and sincere in equal measure, and the longer you spend with it, the more sincere it begins to sound. Even though, I must add, the album doesn't radically change over its runtime. There's no grand con being pulled here. The Mollusk is, to put it simply, written with the understanding that the greatest comedy won't let its characters know they're in a comedy, and as a result, there is genuine character, pathos, drama, caked within this strikingly incisive parody of 70s rock if you're willing to get wet. And this all comes into focus with the final track. Everyone who's heard this album knows what I'm talking about. It's She Wanted to Leave. It's one of the few times that pure audio has brought me to tears. In this song, three strikingly short little verses detail an unspeakable tragedy, an unreliable narrator confronted with the yawning depths of his own cruelty and willful self-delusion, and then his choice to delve deeper into it. It's heartbreaking. But the funny thing is that in the context of the track list, this doesn't even feel that out of place. Far from it, it's still a throwback rock track where the guy's doing a character voice. I'd go as far as to say the last 13 tracks are part of the reason that this is the perfect note to end on. After you really peer into this record, the few moments of dead straight tragedy stop feeling like outliers, and the humanity of the songwriting really begins to peer through. It's still funny, it never stops being funny. But the purpose of it being funny is not to deflect or deprecate. The comedy of the mollusk acts as a meticulous disarming of the listener. The comedy kills the ego, not as an invitation to turn your brain off, but to engage closer and deeper emotionally. The presence of pink eye on my leg is what allows she wanted to leave to act directly on the soul. Ween got put on the map with their reckless indulgence into juvenile glee for the airheaded sake of it, the Mollusk does something else, something more. H.H. H. Gregg is a retail chain of consumer electronics. It's also how you spell the sound I make when the waiter asks me how I'm enjoying my food. H.H. Mm. H. Gregg has a bit of a rocky history, but the story I want to tell starts with a particular ad that ran in 2010. Y you might have seen it. Panasonic Blu-ray, $99. H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-
And this idea was, again, repurposed and remixed by the actual subject of this tangent, one Jerry Terry. Redoin is a tour de force of unknowable emotions, and I revisit it at least once per day. The voice is on its own, soaring at the top of the mix, completely divorced from the original inspiration rather than blending in with it. The lyrics are boomed at us via typography on a cosmic backdrop, like this is a divine message that we are unequipped to comprehend. But at the same time, the atmosphere is intimate nostalgic, a bygone era of staying up until 2 a.m. and seeing the forbidden programs on TV, strange infomercials that seem to go on forever, a representation of the unknowable profundity with which our sleep-deprived young minds perceive the world beyond the threshold of bedtime. That's not the main thing I want to talk about here, though. Uh, I detailed this backstory because I want you to do a little audience participation. Imagine for a second that you are Jerry Terry. Redoin is your first viral success in a while, and Halloween is coming up. How do you, with these particular talents the Lord has afforded you, make a seasonally appropriate piece? Well, I have one answer. The boys are back in town, in parentheses, to kill you, is something I would assume was inspired directly by the hands of God had I not done a background check on the artistic lineage behind it. It has such a precise vibe that I haven't seen replicated before or since. I am obsessed with it and maddened that there isn't anything like it. It is a Neil Cicerega style edit of Thin Lizzy's The Boys Are Back in Town, reinterpreting the singer to be a harbinger warning us through a computer screen that we are being hunted by the titular boys, who are implied to be some horrible demonic horde. By unknown means, the boys seem to be hijacking the incoming message with their own interjections, and it's fucking scary. It is a legitimately masterful exercise in building tension. Like, it's, it's one thing to come up with this ass-to-the-wall concept, and another thing entirely to actually execute upon it. Jerry Terry admittedly doesn't have much to work with, but it goes so smoothly in spite of this. When the guy says, now my blood will spill, he sounds genuinely dejected, even though he's a Clinton's mixed version of something with a completely different context. Thin Lizzy is acting the part from 40 years away. It's so fucked up. How does this exist? Why does it work? The framing does a lot too. The entire piece taking place on a narrow computer screen with a stomach churning amount of dead space on either side. It took a lot of restraint to not have one of the boys pop out from there is what I'm saying. Thanks for that. The boys are back in town in parentheses to kill you is also, importantly, very aware of the inherent silliness of the concept. You know that chick that got up and slapped the boy's face? Now she's dead. We are experiencing all this as a song after all, and it's fun. This remix is a blood pumping jam full of life and personality. It's the most that a piece of Halloween media has actually captured the simultaneously macabre and joyous vibe of the actual holiday. This video has almost 3 million views, and he deserves it. It's what the world needs. And then four years later, he made a sequel, and it's the scariest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. Kiss me. Rather than a Neil Cicerega style edit, Kiss Me in parentheses Kill Me is a Minecraft parody style rewrite of the classic song by Sixpence None the Richer. This is what I actually wanted to talk about here, so now's your chance to check it out. It's a treat! The degree of freedom offered by this shift in medium is more than fully utilized. The lyricism drips with genuinely poetic detail. 
Our star actress gives a knockout performance as a lovesick adventurer taken by a sparsely understood transformation. And he, he, he reharmonizes the song. Wait, wait. What was your father's name? Why does his map feel just like human skin? It's so dumb. It's seriously so dumb. The world building here is immaculate and grounded. Elements that were delivered half as jokes, like the perceptual disturbances in the previous entry, are now chilling knives of horror. The warning text we receive from a friend precedes the singer telling of the voices she hears of long-dead loved ones calling for her to leave, implying the transformation has already set within ourselves. It would feel so viscerally real, so perfectly immersive, if not for the singularly, blindingly bright artistic choice to deliver the entire story to us in song. Not just in song, in... in the top secret extended mix of Kiss Me by Sixpence None the Richer. It's so fucking stupid! And yet, without fail, when the final verse starts, every strand of fur on my back stands straight up with the force of a thunderbolt. God, it just goes so hard. I wish I could go this hard. I sincerely do. I wish I could have an idea this bold-facedly stupid and play it this fucking straight and this fucking well. The boys are back in town in parentheses to kill you was self-aware. This is something else. Something more. I've opened up the path. You wake up from this scary dream and laugh. So, uh, there's this movie that's out right now. It's called Everything Everywhere All at Once. You might have seen it. It's really stupendously good, and it kind of fundamentally changed how I feel about this whole art thing. Everything Everywhere All at Once is, as you might have heard, a lot. It's an immigrant story. It's a hectic martial arts action movie. It's a surreal comedy. It's the feel-good R-rated family movie of the summer. It's not just good. It's obviously unavoidably excellent in a way that a high schooler could understand. To adequately synopsize this film is to thematically interpret it. The intrinsic duality of nihilist philosophy isn't just a theme of the film, it's two of the main characters. It's a 2001 A Space Odyssey sized event, like, it'll make people better at watching movies through its excellence. You don't need me to explain this movie to you. Rest assured, you'll get it. You'll go home and write a video essay about it. There are going to be so many fucking video essays about this movie. Anyways, Everything Everywhere All at Once kind of spelled out what I've been trying to find the words for my whole life as an artist, and it's why I started working on this video. See, this film is deeply profound in its theming and character work. It is spectacularly and intently directed, and it is just so dumb. It's so dumb, constantly. It never stops being dumb. It's a million dollar smosh sketch. It's 50 Geico ads drawing end to end. It frequently delves into legitimate Rick and Morty humor. It's dumb all the way down. And yet, it is not cynical. It is as far away from cynicism as you could possibly be. There is no, well that just happened, moment, sir or ma'am letterboxd reviewer. That was you actually. The whole movie is played completely sincerely. Every stupid joke comes back multiple times, each time louder and dumber, until suddenly we're at the climax and each thread is concluded at the same time with universe-destroying emotional clarity. The brazen stupidity of this film isn't a distancing tactic. It's the exact opposite. Everything Everywhere All at Once is so human in its dumbness that it hurts. 
And it isn't a head-empty, wholesome vibes movie either. That's just another slightly gayer form of ironic detachment. Everything Everywhere All at Once really wants you to think about it. The symbolism in this film is so loud, so bright, it's difficult to look away from it. The duality of the bagel and the googly eye permeates this film so pervasively as if it's part of the color palette. They were one step away from just showing the symbols forming the sides of a yin-yang. Every alternate universe is differentiated not only with setting, but with filmmaking. The universe where Evelyn has a reconciliation with her alternate husband, who never married her, is caked in film grain and judicious undercrank. The Claire de Lune hot dog finger universe is represented with soft romantic pinks and yellows. Everything everywhere all at once is deeply in love with the medium it's in. What I see in this film is not crude blunt humor as a method of distancing, not pastiche as an invitation to stop caring, not larger than life emotions as permission to turn your brain off. It's an intimately disarming vulnerability, honesty, humility, yet still with an unstoppable self-assuredness. It's a leap of faith, a leap towards bliss and catharsis, a single-minded persistence of your own divine mission in spite of everything. This is beauty. This is the sublime. This is art. This is why I'm a goddamn furry. The author behind Three Fifths of Echo, goes by Howley, has gone on record saying that writing the ending for TJ's route ruined him emotionally and is the primary reason he outsourced the remaining two routes to his buddy. This afforded him the time to start work on Ad Astra, an indulgent piece of slow burn erotica about being kidnapped by a himbo wolf alien, the furry writer's version of holding up in your room with a pint of ice cream. But then, and I know I'm not in Howley's head, but I think he quickly realized that he simply could not leave it at that. He had to ask why you were being kidnapped, what this would mean for your relationship, what strife and heartbreak would result, what would have to happen in order for this wolf to earn your trust and affection. It is simply not in Howley's divine quest to just make the gay furry version of a beach episode. And instead of hiding away from his destiny, shielding himself from God's light, giving the player easy answers and hot yif, he makes the most characterful and cathartic piece of furry porn in existence. It's challenging, confronting, and still incredibly indulgent and deeply aware of its place in furry literature. I seriously can't fucking imagine what Divine Beauty would look like if not exactly this. I would detransition for Amicus. This is normally the part where I tell you to go play it because it's free and also like 12 hours of reading, but it's also definitely furry porn. It's not something else disguised as furry porn. There is illustrated dog dick in this game. Counter disclaimer, the writing in this game is so transcendentally good that you should play it anyway. Both Ad Astra and Echo hit me in ways that no other story has, but there is nary a hint of detraction coming from the simple fact that almost everyone in these games is an adorable fuzzy animal person. There is no acknowledgement towards this unbearably bright concession that was made before the games even existed due to their status as fandom work. And why would there be? The furry aesthetic, as a whole, is a concession towards the symbolic, the sensory, the ever so slightly autistic. When I put furries on my album covers, I am, undeniably, precluding myself from being taken seriously, but it is this exact tension that I hope serves to communicate my sincerity. I find the aesthetic to be disarming in and of itself, beyond it just being an honest part of me. It is an intentional weapon against the normal defenses that go up when most people are confronted with different or difficult art, that I'm trying to outsmart you, that you'll be seen as dumb if you don't applaud it. I just think it's a little harder to do that when there's furries on the cover, you know? I'm disarming myself and hopefully disarming the listener a little bit too. It's not permission to stop taking me seriously. God knows, I still take myself very seriously. Jesus, calm down. My furry album covers are, hopefully, giving permission to the same part of you that is permitted by the satire of the mollusk, the musical fervor of Kiss Me in parentheses Kill Me, the blinding sincerity of Everything Everywhere All at Once. The part that knows this is ultimately a performance. The part that wants to stop observing and start engaging, participating, critiquing, feeling, consciously, effortfully, maturely. This is what it means to be on the side of art. This is what I'm striving for. This is the sublime humility and confidence that I wish to embody in myself. Whether I succeed or not is up for you to decide. My name is Avery. I'm a dog. What are you?